Well, a very common theological question people ask, and which you may have asked as well, is why do bad things happen to good people? This question is a difficult question to answer because the question is usually asked when someone faces a loss of a loved one or someone going through sickness or a physical ailment or some other problem. It's a question about God and His goodness, and if He's good, why are these things happening? People ask this question, though, thinking the bad that is happening is out there and fail to look at the bad in their own heart and their own life. And I guess the question we have to ask before we ask this question is, who is good? Well, in the Psalms, well, in the Old Testament, they asked a similar question. It was a different question, but a similar question. And and the question they would ask is, why do good things happen to bad people? Why are good things happening to bad people? For example, in Psalm 37, David said, Do not fret because of evildoers. Be not envious toward wrongdoers. Because they were quite envious. Everything's going their way. The evildoers do all that is wrong and the scene they get away with it. Where's the justice? Well, in Psalm 73, the psalmist named Asaph wrote, For I was envious of the arrogant as I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pains in death and their body is fat. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like mankind. You're prospering the wrong people, God, and hurting the good people. Why are you doing this? Well, Jeremiah complained to God in Jeremiah 12. He says, Righteous are you, O Lord, that I would plead my case with you. Indeed, I would discuss matters of justice with you. Why has the way of the wicked prosper? Why are all those who deal in treachery at ease? Basically, when he says, I would discuss matters of justice with you, basically say, God, you are, you are righteous, I'll say that, but your justice is, a, you know, I don't know about that. We're going to have to have a discussion about your justice, because it doesn't seem to match up. Of course, that's a dangerous thing to ask God to exercise his justice, because what do we deserve? <sighs> the struggle of this evil age is that we live in an evil age. We're caught up in the traps that are set, the lies that are promoted, and the values of this world that are demanded. We get caught up on the problems of the day, in the divisive language, in the hurtful rhetoric, and we lose sight of the grace and love of God Almighty. We lose sight of what is valuable. We begin to reach for things that are not valuable. In this evil age, people will die, sadly. Addictions will happen. Conflicts will abound. People will make poor decisions. Disease and sickness will take place. Poverty will grow. Starvation will continue. Domestic fighting will not stop. Human trafficking will continue. You will face financial problems, etc., etc., etc. That doesn't mean we, we continue to fight against those things. We continue to fight for the things that are good. But those things will happen. And when you face these things, it's easy to get angry and frustrated and hurtful. And then you react. And the, the first person that you tend to appeal to is God. Why, God? Even Christ on the cross says, my God, my God, why? We become jealous, envious, and empty. We lose sight of what is valuable and important. You know, in, in, in the psalm, the psalmist in 23, 4 said this, Though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. I want you to take that to heart. We all walk through the valley of the shadow of death, of fear, and anger, and frustration. That is why we call this age evil. The psalmist didn't say, I walk around the valley of the shadow of death. I stop walking in it. I stop walking while I'm through it. I stop walking altogether. (laughs) No, he said, I walk through. It's not so much that you're walking through it. It's whom you're walking with as you go through it. Whose hand are you holding when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death? We are walk, we're all walking this path, but it depends on whose hand you're holding. Hold Christ's hand. Hold the hand who created you, who loves you. Hold the hand that empowers you, embraces you, and guides you, and who has a destination for you. So I challenge you today, hold God's hand. Hold God's hand as you walk through the valley of the shadow of death. 
Hold his hand in the midst of all that you're going through. Hold his hand knowing he won't forsake you, abandon you, or mislead you. Hold his hand. You know, as Peter's writing this letter, he is writing to the churches who are aliens in this world. That's what he calls them all in verse, verse 1 there. Meaning they're not welcome. They don't belong to this world. But they belong to God. Their world may reject them, their communities, their family religion, even their families may reject them. But God has chosen them and invited them, and they're part of his family. The people in these towns who follow Christ, who gathered together with other believers, were intimidated. They were slandered against. They were betrayed. They were bullied. And these people were struggling with this. They may have felt defeated. They may have wanted to give up. When you face that pressure, that community pressure, that bully, and you sometimes you just throw up your hands and I just want to give up. When we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, this evil age, our hands have a tendency to slip. And we sometimes think, I need both hands to deal with this. I can't hold his hand anymore. Don't hold, don't don't let go. Don't let go. Hold his hand. Your emotions at time and your circumstances may betray you. Don't let go. Hold on to his hand. People in these churches were struggling, so Peter told them to hold on. Don't let go. What you have is so valuable and precious. I think that is where the problem is. We lose sight of what is valuable and what is precious. Hold on to his hand. Peter may have known these churches, the followers of Christ. Their inheritance was secure. They were protected by God, and their future was certain. That's what he was telling them. The foundation of their life, salvation, hope was on the rock, solid nature of Christ and the power of his resurrection. The soundness of their foundation is Christ. Christ is risen from the dead. When you invest in God, when you give your life completely to God, you will not be disappointed. You have something that is real, solid, true, and strong. What God has given you and the promises that he has made to you, you can, they cannot be removed. They cannot be stopped and they will not be hindered. God is faithful. He will keep his word. God can, God's will cannot be thwarted. Evil will not get the final say. Death does not get the final say. God overcomes. You know, in Genesis 50, Jacob, the patriarch and father of the 12 sons who became the 12 tribes, uh, be, uh, is buried. And his sons were scared. After they buried him in the land, the, the promised land, uh, they then go back to Egypt. And the brothers are thinking, you know, my, our, our father's dead. And now Joseph... <laughs> He's going to take it. He's going to get mad at us and he's going to take revenge on us. And so they write up this uh, phony letter that says, be nice to your brothers. <laughs> Forgive them. That's sort of my paraphrase of what that verse says. Well, Joseph, seeing through their attempts, says this in uh, Genesis 50. He says, do not be afraid for I, am I in God's place as you as for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. And that's the way we have to look at the way we live in this evil age. That, yes, things are going to happen. We're going to struggle with the things, but we have to realize this evil that we may face, this struggle that we may be going through, does not get the final say. God will turn it around. This world may mean it for evil, but God turns it for good. That's the hope we have. When you go through the valley of shadow of death, evil things may happen. The world will mean evil against you. People may inflict harm on you, say terrible things, but God will turn it for good. God will not let evil win. God meant it for good. Hold God's hand. Don't let go. God will turn it around. Number one, keep your eye on the destination. Let's look at verse, chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. In this, you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. So that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I've heard it said that anything worth doing is difficult. Have you heard of that? Typically, if it's worth doing, it's usually difficult. Most of those who have seen success in their lives have had to endure many difficulty, long hours, loss of income, failures. Those who seek to get that degree, they work long hours to get it done. Staying up late. Those who start a business will usually not see a profit for a few years. Working late, long hours. 
those who seek to play a sport have to practice week in, week out, eating the right food, staying physically fit. A concert pianist, a research scientist, or an author spends hours, days, weeks preparing, practicing, reading, writing, working. They give up recreation. They think, dream, and sleep their obsession. They give up blood, sweat, and tears. They push through failure and are relentless in achieving their goal. They have a united heart, a dedicated passion, and a willing mind. They're zealous, and that reason people become successful is that they have an eye on the destination. They see what they want. They have the end in mind. Now, Donald Whitney, in his book, Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life, wrote this, Discipline without direction is drudgery. Discipline without direction is drudgery. And then he gives this illustration. He says, imagine a a six-year-old boy named Kevin whose parents have enrolled him in music lessons. And after school, every afternoon, he sits in the living room and reluctantly strums his guitar home on the range. And as he's, while he's doing this, he looks outside the window and he sees his buddies playing baseball in the park across the street. That's discipline without direc- direction becomes drudgery. Now suppose Kevin is visited by an angel one afternoon during guitar practice. And in a vision, he's taken to Carnegie Hall and he's shown a guitar virtuoso that is just overwhelming. This guitarist is given a concert. And usually bored by classical music, though, Kevin is astonished by what he sees and hears. The musician's fingers dance excitedly on the strings with fluidity and grace. Kevin thinks of how stupid and clunky his fingers feel when they halt and stumble over the chords. The virtuoso blends clean, sorry notes into a musical aroma that wafts from his guitar. Kevin remembers the toneless, irritating discord that comes stumbling out of his. But Kevin is enchanted by what he hears and sees. His head tilts slightly to one side as he listens. He drinks in everything as he's listening. He never imagined that anyone could play the guitar like this. What do you think, Kevin? Asks the angel. The answer from the six-year-old Kevin is, wow. The vision vanishes, and the angel is again standing in front of Kevin in his living room. Kevin, says the angel, the wonderful musician you saw is you in a few years. Then pointing at the guitar, the angel declares, but you must practice. The angel disappears and Kevin finds himself alone with his guitar. Do you think his attitude now changes in how he will see his practice? As long as he remembers what he's going to become, Kevin's discipline will have direction and no drudgery. A goal that will pull him into the future. Discipline without direction is drudgery. But we have direction. We have a goal. We know what we can and will become. We have a destination. We may find life difficult now, but we know our future hope. Hold God's hand. First observation, rejoice greatly for God is leading you. Rejoice greatly for God is leading you. Rejoice because of what God has done. Rejoice for what God is doing. Rejoice for what God is going to do in the future. You are protected. That's what he says there in verse 5. Who are protected by the power of God. You are protected. Christ is coming again. Your salvation is real. This evil age is doomed. Christ wins. Rejoice. What the enemy wants to do is take your eyes off of God, off of what he's leading, and focus only on the present moment, the present problems. Then he will say, if God cares for you, why are you going through all of this? When this happens, and it will happen, run. Don't walk. Run to his word. Run to his sight. Read his word. Read his promises. Hold on to his word. Hold on to God's hand. Remember God's care. The churches here that Paul was writing to were facing persecution. They were distressed by various trials that, that could be outright violence, theft of property, or bullying tactics. Their commitment to Christ was challenged by the culture and the community values that they lived in. Most cities practiced some form of what was called emperor worship. Let me tell you, in America, we're far from that. <laughs> well, maybe some people do. I don't know. Worship politicians. Don't worship politicians. But they had, this, uh, they had emperor worship, where they would worship the emperor. They would give uh, uh, obedience, and they would praise the emperor and say, You're Savior and Lord of the earth. 
And of course, the Christians and followers of Christ would not pay homage to the emperor. They would not participate in the festivals and parades and the community events. Could you imagine, you know, like if we remember we used to have fairs? Remember that and get togethers? <laughs> imagine if we had we went to the fair and it was all praising the politician. Like, well, I don't want to do that. <laughs> Here to bow that. And we dedicate this in honor and praise and worship to this man or this woman. We wouldn't want to participate. That's what it was like. Every event that took place was something like that. They would only worship and give, and of course, the church would only worship and give allegiance to Christ. And they would be singled out. They would stand out. And of course, when they were singled out, they were insulted. They were mocked. They were attacked. It was difficult physically, mentally, emotionally to follow Christ. It was difficult to run a business. So Peter, you know, says, look at the end. Look at your destination. Look at what you're becoming in Christ. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 4, he says, For momentary, light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. In addition, in 1 Corinthians 2, it says, Things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard. Does that say heard there? And which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. I love that verse. The reality set before us, the promise Uh, given to us, the destination revealed is beyond words, beyond experience. No eye has seen, no ear has heard what God has planned. It is too wonderful, too amazing. No amount of what we endure will ever equal in strength and length of what we will know and experience in the presence of God Almighty. God has an amazing future planned for you. Peter tells the churches, don't give up. Don't let go of God's hand. Don't get caught up in the momentary pain of persecution. Keep your eye on what is ahead. God has an amazing future for you. Live in the faith of God in the midst of your suffering, proving to all who see the power of God's faithfulness. Explain your faith by how you live. Reveal your faith by enduring through the moment. Your faith is more precious than gold. Now, gold is one of the most sought-after precious uh, metals. It's hard to get if it's wanted by most everyone. It's a standard of wealth. It's a staple of currency. It's worth now, I think, of today's market, $2,000 per ounce. So if you want to buy an ounce, you have to pay $2,000. The streets in heaven, by the way, are paved with gold. The most sought-after metal is pavement in heaven. I mean, I don't see anyone going, digging up some pavement and say, ooh, look what I got. It's pavement in heaven. You know, in, in Luke 16, it says, what is highly valuable to man is detestable to God. Your faith will endure longer than gold. Your faith will prove to all and many. And when you show and live in faith, you will show the world who God is. They will see the presence of God. They will experience the love of God. And, they, and, and you will know the hope of God. God has prepared for you an amazing future, an amazing destination. What we endure today is minimal compared to what we will know ultimately. God has an amazing future planned for you. And as you live through the struggles of this evil age and devotion to God, it becomes a shout of worship and praise to Him. And you invite others to know Him. It honors Christ. It reveals His love. It gives an opportunity for those caught up in sin to see the beauty of our Lord. Hold on to the hand of God. Number two, keep your eye on Christ. Let's take a look at verse 8 and 9. And though you have chose, have not seen Him, you love Him. And though you do not see Him now but believe in Him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining to the outcome of your faith the salvation of your soul. Now, the main weapon the enemy unleashes against you and me are lies and deception. He wants you to live according to the lie that he tells you. He wants to implant in your mind and into your brain a lie. And he, wants to, and he starts at you at young, when you're young. Whenever you go through something uh, struggling, a traumatic event or a difficulty, a failed experience, or when one of those things happen, the enemy will lay a lie into your head, into your mind, and he'll say, that's because of who you are. And so a stronghold in your mind will develop. 
And then you'll live your life based on that lie. And that lie will tell you who you are, how to act. And then, then we'll tell you the truth. God loves you. Jesus died for you. Jesus saved you. And you'll say, yes, I know that. But deep within, you won't believe it. You won't believe it because that lie is, has taken over. And you've got to say, no, enough. This lie is a lie. God's truth is real. You have to root it out. You have to get rid of it. You have to root out the lie with the truth of God's love for you. God has invested in you. Your worth was settled at the cross. God does love you. God sees you as his, and he desires for you to know him and walk in the freedom he has for you. He wants to lavish upon you his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness. God loves you. God seeks you and invites you into his presence. The enemy says, you're not good enough. Christ says, I made you good enough. The enemy says, you're too good. You don't need Christ. Christ says, you are a sinner, but I died for you and forgave you of your sins. Christ is truth, and the truth will set you free. You acknowledge his word. You bathe in his word, and the lie will die. Operate out of the truth. Walk in manner that is right. Know the reality of what God has given. God does not lie. You're not a mistake. And, of course, on the other side, you're not the greatest of all. (laughs) You are loved. Hold on to his hand. First observation, love, believe, and rejoice in Christ. Peter knew the many faces in the churches that he was writing to. He uh, probably spent some considerable amount of time preaching and teaching them. He prayed with them. He cried and he wept for those who died and those who were persecuted. Peter had the privilege of walking with Christ, hearing his preaching, watching him heal, seeing him die, rejoicing in his resurrection. Peter was able through Christ to heal many who were sick and even raised a woman from the dead in the name of Christ in Acts 9. The men and women who were in the churches he wrote to did not see Christ. They didn't walk with him. They didn't hear his messages as Peter had. And they they didn't have that experience that Peter had. And the enemy who lies loves to leave a seed of doubt in your mind, just a little seed of doubt. You know, when that doubt grows, it just grows and grows and grows. And before you know it, you're doubting everything God said and did. Do you see Jesus? Where is he? Well, the churches did not see Jesus the way Peter did. But they saw him nonetheless. They saw Jesus in each other. We make Jesus known today by how we live and how we love. Jesus said this in John 13. He says, by this all men will know that you're my disciples if you love, if you have love for one another. People will know who you belong to. We make him known by our love. When Jesus rose from the dead and revealed himself to the disciples, Thomas was not there. Remember that story in John 20? And he did not believe the other disciples. And they said, hey, we saw Jesus. Well, I don't believe it. I wasn't there. And unless I see him and and touch his, his scars... Then I'll believe it. Of course, Jesus shows up one week later, and in John 20, it says this, Reach here with your finger and see my hands, and reach here your hand and put it in my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God, Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are they who do not see and yet believe. Blessed are those who do not see and yet believe. Now, I wonder if Thomas actually did touch his side. I mean, he might be like, oh, (laughs) when he saw Jesus. We do not give doubt a foothold. We do not give in to the lie of the enemy and doubt the personal work of the Lord Jesus Christ. He did die. He did rise again. And he does love you. You have not seen the earthly Christ who walked this earth and spoke the word. We have faith knowing that he did walk this earth. And he did accomplish our salvation. Our foundation rests on the word of God. On the truth of God's word. You know, it's interesting that the Bible is the most attacked book and the most reviled book. You cannot bring this book into schools. I mean, go ahead and try. Start preaching inside the school zones about Jesus. See what happens. By the way, you are free to preach Jesus wherever you go, by the way. There may be earthly consequences, but you are free to teach his name. It is the most hated book. It is not welcomed in most institutions, businesses, or colleges. It's challenged, it's scrutinized, and it's said to be made up. 
It is rejected and shunned. It is burned and ended it outlawed. But his word is truth. That's why it shows why we don't like the truth, because the truth exposes who you are. Men love darkness rather than the light. These people, these church, these people in the churches in First Peter, like ourselves, did not see the living Christ walk this earth, but they did experience him. Like we today, we experience his love, his word, his truth, his forgiveness, his salvation. We experience his presence. We do not see him, but we know him. We know his word, his character, his nature. We know Christ, and that's why we rejoice. We believe and we love. We have experienced the forgiveness of sins. We know the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. Christ promised us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives within all, his, all Christ's followers. We are strengthened by the word and empowered by the spirit. We're enlightened by the truth and celebrate the end. The outcome that awaits us is the future he has in store for you and me. The knowledge of Christ becomes ever more real when we realize that Christ and what he accomplished. When he was on the cross, he took my place. He took your place. He bore the wrath of God so you would not have to under, go under have to experience that you would not have to experience the wrath of god he paid the penalty for your sin and my sin he bled he was mocked and many spat upon him he took your place and when you know this and when you experience this you see christ and you begin to grasp the magnitude of god's amazing and eternal love that he has for you so even if you do not see him physically you know him and you hold his hand he walks with you Hold his hand. Number three, keep your eye on your salvation. Let's look again. at. Let's read six through nine. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith be more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor and revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible, full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. You know, what we're seeing today, sadly, what we're seeing sadly in the news today is happening in our cities and our country is horrible. You know, it's just a terrible display of what happens when sin nature just continues to grow and grow and grow. You know, for example, a man in the Bronx was crossing the street with his six-year-old daughter when he was gunned down, just crossing the street. A woman in Brooklyn was leaving a a store as bullets flew. In Queens, a 14-year-old boy was approached by two people and then shot three times. This is all happening during the day. And, And they don't care if there's witnesses. New York City saw more than double the daytime shootings that has occurred between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. from May 1st through July 1st than it did during the same period last year as the Big Apple continues to grapple with the starting uptick in violence. New York Police Department statistics show a nearly 137% increase in the number of shootings that occurred over a three-month period during the day, light hours. From May through July 20th, 168 incidences were reported. And while the same time, uh, while during the same period uh, last year, it was only 71. In Portland, Oregon, or Portland, Oregon has seen a 200% increase in gun violence in just in the month of July. The poor areas of Chicago is like playing Russian roulette. Who's going to survive the weekend? For example, a little boy named Janari Riggs, who was nine years old, just playing outside in his yard, killed by gunshots. The travesty of gun violence is growing and becoming all too common tell of seeing kids and adults killed. The sin nature is revealed and exposed for what it is. The anger is seething. The violence is increasing. The hate is soaring. The rhetoric is growing. The division is festering and the culture is crumbling. There can be no freedom without morality. There can be no morality without the cross. Christ is the hope of all mankind. He is the hope for all the world. Hold on to his hand. Uh, Observation one, outcome is freedom. The world Peter grew up in is violent. 
in every age and every culture throughout our human history, there is violence. There's hate. There's war. Our faith in Christ is the key to overcome evil of this evil age, not for ourselves, but for all people. Faith in Christ is the means to heal the world, to heal people, to heal communities, and to heal your hearts. You know, when Christ went to the cross and died on the cross for your sins and mine, he took the punishment and he removed the penalty. He paid our debt. Early on in Jesus' ministry, particularly Matthew 5, Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote this when writing about this statement. He says, in the face of the cross, the disciples realized that they too were his enemies and that he had overcome them by his love. He'd overcome them by his love. Jesus said this because all of humanity is God's enemy. But God sought out his enemies and he loved them. He did not hate them. We are called of God, saved of God, loved of God, justified by God, sanctified by God, promised of God, and called to live like God, act like God, speak like God, forgive like God, and love like God. The outcome of your faith is freedom because you have been given everything in Christ. You have been given Christ. There is nothing else to gain. You have have it all in Him. You are now free. What more would you need than Christ Himself? So you are free to love. When you have faith in Christ, which is more precious than gold, you bring to this violent, dying world the healing love of God that saves them. What this world needs is a transformed heart. The change everyone is asking for, the peace that we strive for, the love that we hunger for will not come from policy changes, laws written, and mandates demanded, but from a changed heart. I mean, some of these cities have some of the strictest gun laws, and they're out using them. We need a changed heart. (laughs) Write all the laws you want. But you're not going to change anything until the heart's changed. This world needs Christ. Our faith in God is the transformed heart needed for the world to experience. The world needs Christ. Every individual needs Christ. Every lonely heart, every struggling parent, every addict, every rich person, every poor person, every lost person, every forgotten and misplaced person needs Christ. And when you live out your faith, when you speak your faith, when you exalt Christ because of your faith, you are bringing healing, holiness, and a transforming touch of Christ. This is what it means to, when it says obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of souls. The practice of your faith counteracts the effects of violence and the selfishness of this evil age. It counteracts it. I believe the only way we're going to see victory each and every day is when we love each other and when we shine the light of Christ and when we show the love of people, when we defeat the evil with the love of God. You are free to love. And the only way to do this is to hold his hand. So hold God's hand. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that even though we walk through the valley of shadow of death, We don't fear evil, for you are with us. You are with us, God. Thank you so much. Praise your name. Thank you that we can walk with you. Oh, Lord, I pray that we do not give up, that we don't let go, that we hold on, and and we know you're holding on to us. Thank you for your love, for your mercy, your grace. Let us be the light of Christ and the love of God to those around us.